demonstration of a of the dangers of a of basically a reverse shell, but um, a lot of antivirus will pick up something that's generated through Metasploit or generated through um, Netcat or using Netcat at all. Um, antivirus usually picks that up, or at least some of them do. You have a good chance of picking that up. What really somewhat shocked me, I guess I just wasn't aware, was if you simply wrote a script, like this is using Python, that uses a socket library and an OS library to basically make a connection back and forth between two machines, antivirus really doesn't pick it up. And I'm going to demonstrate how this works, and then I'll show some screenshots of what antivirus thought of this. So um, basically we have two VMs, we have a Kali Linux which is going to be the attacker and we have a Windows 7 which is going to be the victim. They're both running locally um, inside uh, on my laptop here. So let me get to it. Um, on the Kali Linux side, the script there is the server script which basically um, I followed, so I was taking a course that pretty much outlined the bare bones version of this script and I've added on to it a little bit. Um, the idea here is that we'll start with the core function. You have this connection script that basically creates, uh, instantiates the socket uh, library and then we bind to a socket. In this case it is binding to uh, its own IP here at port 8777 and it's going to listen. So it's just going to listen on that port number <clears throat> of its own of, of, the, of the Kali Linux VM and <clears throat> what it's expecting is to get a connection request from a victim and that's how reverse shell works <clears throat> because it's very hard <clears throat> to drill through like a firewall and you know access a machine you don't even know its IP but if you, but if a if an attacker uh, gives you a malicious code, right, then that code executes. It will make a connection back to the attacker, and the attacker then has the the tunnel, tunnel to your specific machine, even if you're behind a firewall, or whatever. So anyway, here's what we have. We have this uh, simple, simple Python. Um, there's some commands that have been um, written into it, like one to exit. <clears throat> Another command is to grab, and grab will basically take a file from the remote system and copy it over. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of the script really right now. I'm just going to show how this works, and uh, I'll probably talk more about this in a full write-up. Anyway, that's the script on the server side. I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually turn it on. Okay. It's listening and then on the Windows side I have a similar script <clears throat> which acts as the client and it's going to basically make a connection back to the attacker machine as you see right here. Now I used a utility pi to exe to convert this script into an ex Windows executable. I just happened to name it Win10 SSID so hey it looks like something maybe not so bad person clicks it and then nothing happens on Windows but over here on the Kali Linux side we get a reverse shell and this is a little prompt within the script we wrote so if I do a dir a Windows command you'll see I'm pulling up the Windows <laughs> directory over here on this side I'm pulling up the desktop so you can see I see uh, a folder called 2exe that's right here I see client.py, that's right there. You see all these different things, and I could even do like DRC colon backslash. And look at that. We have an auto execute.bat on the, see, you know, all the things you would expect on a Windows machine. In fact, <clears throat> we can even grab one of these files. So let's uh, grab um, auto execute. That and we're going to name it something different over here on this side. We'll just call it remote uh, bat. And there it is. I just pulled it over and we'll open this with an editor. You can see there's some data in it. 
And that's pretty much how you can see what's on the other person's folder. I'm in other machine plus pull it over. I'm working on a push command to push files onto the remote system. But besides that, you could also execute something. Um, for example, if you ran <clears throat> the start command and you did like, I think it's called write. Yeah, see, I popped open and actually executed, turned something on on the Windows side. So you can see there's a lot of craziness that can happen here. I'm going to shut this down now. But this is now to show the next part. Now, all this could be done in Kali Linux using built-in tools. You don't need to write your own scripts. You could be using Netcat, and you could be generating like malware uh, for your pen tests and seeing you know your own security um, assessments. But here's the crazy thing: I ran the this little Windows executable through Virus Total, which ran it across 55 antivirus. Now. I thought they would have picked up on this. I thought at least 30% would have said, this is suspicious. Um, only one. One came up, and that was McAfee GW edition. Everything else you see passed. And that's just the A's. And then over here we have, <laughs> you see that regular McAfee passed it, Malwarebytes passed it, Kaspersky passed it. I mean, all F-Secure passed it. Uh, you know. Clam AV passed it, all this stuff. And like I said, only one out of 55 antivirus actually flagged it as, and it flagged it as maybe it's suspicious. Seems like it might be a Trojan. Um, of course, the whole purpose of this is to do a security assessment. Um, but, you know, this isn't about actually doing damage to someone. This is more about seeing if in a penetration test if you are paid to test somebody's infrastructure and you have permission to uh, something like this could be used to actually gain access to the network that you've been hired to test but beyond that even more important the craziest part is it shows how vulnerable we all are I mean this is very simple so I, well, some people ask the instructor in the you know why why did, didn't this get flagged by so many antivirus? Um, and his ex explanation was that antivirus picks up on file uh, signatures that are left behind by malicious uh, malware and by uh, actual viruses. And it, in this case, it's just straight Python writing. You know, it's you know, it's us writing our own Python scripts because it doesn't have a signature of an attack vector. It didn't, doesn't get put into a library to be flagged which is a little crazy because just imagine if instead of this being an exe that does nothing imagine it was packaged as part of a installer and this ran as one of the exes and you're still seeing something happen like maybe you're installing some software and this is running in the background in fact if we were to run task manager it would show up as win 10 ssid running in the background so you may not even know that that's a bad thing. You might think, oh, that's normal. It's an SSID something or another. Um, yeah, it's just mind-boggling to me. But anyway, that's the demo.